tonight we're not just going to focus on digital media businesses, but we're going to talk about entrepreneurship in general, uh, and particularly what we're trying to do to help you be successful um, business people uh, here at ASU. So we have a wonderful panel tonight. So I'll uh, quickly introduce the panel, and then we're going to talk about you know what's been done, what people are doing, what young folks your age are creating all over this great campus, and then talk about um, some of those experiences and then how you can get involved. So starting uh, to my left, we have uh, Nitu Rao, who is the venture uh, manager for uh, ASU's uh, venture uh, Catalyst and Entrepreneurship Program. We have Ariel Hurst, um, who is a Edson finalist, and then went on to uh, do some pretty incredible things. We have Brandon Quester, who is running two startups, uh, all by his lonesome, and he is also an adjunct here, so I'm sure you see him around the Cronkite School. And finally, we have Daniel Zayas, who is an entrepreneur down to his socks. I mean, this man, um, he keeps trying and pivoting and trying again, and I think he's on to something. So what I wanted to do um, before we uh, start with the panel is just kind of talk in general about where you can get information about entrepreneurship at ASU. So if we could bring up the uh, page to um, kind of uh, get you familiar with the uh, the program here. So um, you've probably heard since you've been here, Edson, Edson, Edson. So what is Edson? Edson is a program, and Nitu will tell you a lot more about it, but it's a program that can actually give you seed money and help you get started with your business. And this is a list of just a few of the, um, the, the ventures that were funded by Edson. And as you can see, they range from you know, digital media to people wanting to, a uh, group wanted to start a brewery here, um, Crafts Beer, uh, to people who are doing things to help folks all around the world. And I wanted to share with you just a couple of um, ventures that I've been following for the last couple of years. And one is um, the Up Wheelchair. And um, before we start the video, the thing about this that I liked is that they saw a problem, which is that there are millions of people around the world with manual wheelchairs, and they're limiting in so many ways. I mean, if you don't have a wheelchair and you need one, then that's really limiting. But the thing is, once you have a manual wheelchair, that there are a lot of problems with it. And they, these young people, very bright young people, wanted to solve that problem. So I just wanted to show you a little snippet of their video explaining their product and how they, they're changing wheelchairs. So our solution is up. And this is an elevating wheelchair. It's not a standing wheelchair. So it actually lifts the person up in their seat, just at a higher position. And it's a really simple solution, just like an office chair that you see every day. For UP, what we really try to achieve through our design is to make the uh, entire lifting process as one, which the person simply press the bottom and they can just reach up to grab whatever, whatever they want. And so for the design that we uh, made the seat to be able to adjust the height to somewhere um, somewhere around 10, 10 inches. So the way UP works is it uses simple technology that we're all familiar with. It uses the same type of technology that's in your uh, average office chair, the gas frame. And so what we've done is we've taken two of these and put them directly underneath the seat. So when the user engages these gas springs, there's about 100 pounds of force, at least, directly underneath the user. It's not enough um, force to actually lift the user by himself, but it allows the user to do an easy, simple assisted dip. One of the main design that we incorporated into Op is that we actually have um, a footrest for the user. So when, when the seat is raised up, um, their foot wouldn't be like dangling around in the midair. Another part of the design that we really thought about uh, is that since it's a chair that actually lifts up, like the central gravity point is extremely important that we don't want the person to tilt over or maybe like fall down from the seat. So what happened is that for Ops design, it's slightly longer than like the normal wheelchairs at the same time that we have the supporting wheels that goes towards the back. So we will be selling a lot of different color options for users to be able to customize their own chair. Now, um, I, and I would make it easy. 
I, I would encourage you to definitely go ahead and take a look at that on the page, the Etsy page, just to see. And again, these are young, you know, early 20s, um, people who came together and they created this and it's being manufactured and um, definitely is out there for people um, around the country and around the world. The other one I wanted to show you is a, another um, venture, and, and this is another social venture, but I really liked it because it's solving the problem of what do you do with all this leftover food from restaurants, from, you know, catering. When we have programs here at, at the Cronkite School, we always have a ton of stuff left left over. And um, they thought about it and they're solving that problem. This is a really quick video. Meet Paul, the manager of Tasty Food Catering Company. His company provides food for large events and conferences at hotels and convention centers. To make sure his guests have enough to eat, Paul always prepares more than enough to feed everyone. This often leaves Paul with a lot of extra food that never leaves the kitchen. What does he do with all the leftovers? Paul doesn't like throwing away good food, especially since one out of six Americans struggles with hunger. Luckily, Paul can use the Flash Food mobile application to tell a nearby charitable organization that he has food available to donate. Here's how it works. Let's say Paul has 100 chicken dinners left over after a big event that he would like to donate rather than throw away. He can enter this information into the Flash Food app in a few simple steps. Meanwhile, a group of staff or volunteers working at a local food charity or community organization, let's call them Flash Foodies, are on call waiting to find out about available food donations. Paul's Post sends them into action, dispatching them to Paul's catering event to pick up the extra food. After the Flash Foodies pick up the food using industry-grade containers and practices, they send out a text message through the app to families living nearby who may not know how they will get their next meal. This text message lets them know exactly when and where they can pick up the donated food. A little later, the food is delivered to a local community center, and the people who have arrived are served a good meal. The Flash Food mobile application works with any type of food business that has extra food, including restaurants, caterers, and grocery stores, so any food business manager can use it. Help us change the way we treat our leftover food. Visit flashfoodrecovery.com to learn more about how you can get involved. Right, and, and that's another great example. And one thing I hope that you're picking up on is that it's, it's not that, you know, the these young entrepreneurs, you know, had the light bulb where they literally invite, invented the light bulb or something is so completely unheard of, what they did is they looked around and they saw a need and they took technology that was already existing and they kind of put it together. And um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe, maybe not, maybe I can't do this, you really can, especially if you're passionate about a problem that you're trying to solve, whether that's how people get information, how people, uh, can neighbors can help each other, how we can kept, keep women safe on college campuses, you know, whatever it is, there's a solution out there. And, and if you look at um, programs like CES and some of the new technology that's being created, everything from you know watches where you can get information to um, ability to, to, to do creative things offline where you don't have to be connected to Wi-Fi. All of this stuff is out there now that it's just a matter of you coming up with an idea and then executing it. So how do you do that? How do you go from being a junior or senior, you know, at the Cronkite School or at public programs or wherever, to the point that you're creating your own business? Well, we're here to tell you how you can get from here to there. It's actually not that hard. We do it every day in our lab, and um, one of our experts at ASU will kind of walk you through what she does and how they do it and uh, what the possibilities are. And then we're gonna hear again from some former students uh, who are all very successful and well-dressed now, I'm very impressed. Um, they were in jeans just a few months ago. And they'll tell you about their experiences. So Netu. Hi guys, my name is Niti Rao and I'm with ASU, oh no, it's okay, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group over at Skysong. And uh, the Entrepreneurship Innovation Group is kind of the, the portal for entrepreneurship here at the university. And uh, we, oh, thanks. 
We, uh, as you know, that entrepreneurship is decentralized across the university, so it's embedded in all classes, projects, and, and various things. But if you are looking for a site that has a lot of information about activities that are going on, you should always check out our site at entrepreneurship.asu.edu. Uh, we do a number of things, and I'll kind of go over that in a moment, but I'm going to specifically start off and talk about um, the Edson program. Oops. There we go. So the Edson program was an endowment that we received from or Oren and Charlene Edson. And if you guys aren't familiar with them, they um, Oren Edson started a company out of his garage called the Bayliner Marine Co Company. And uh, he today it is the world's largest manufacturer of luxury boats. And what he had was he started up he came up with this idea when he was in school. And he didn't find any resources at his university in Washington um, to help support his company. So he ended up actually dropping out of school and formed the company. And fortunately, he became very successful. But later on, he met Michael Crow. And, um, and this is how the program started. It's in its eighth year now. And so we've supported more than 100 companies. And some have come become successful, some are still working or pivoted, but we all look at this as a, a learning experience. We, earlier you probably saw it said fail, we want to move ventures faster, so that's kind of the support that we, we bring to all of our startups. And we also accept failure. We know failure is part of it, and we say fail faster. That's one of our mottos at uh, part of the entrepreneurship and innovation groups. So, but you want to learn from your failures, and you can pivot or change or do what you need to to move on so so what the program is is we fund about up to 50 companies and you don't even have to have actually a company to apply you could just be a team with an idea whatever stage it is at you don't even have to have any um, you don't have a prototype you don't have to have a website you just need to talk through what your idea is and you we have a total of four hundred thousand dollars that's available for these startups so this um, part of what you get in the uh, if you get accepted into the Edson program you get space at Skysong and that's a picture of Skysong up there and um, go through that slide so we also offer uh, off, so we offer funding which you get up to twenty thousand dollars in funding and then you get mentor short through the program and we have about 330 mentors that we vetted that we work closely with for all of our startups they are seasoned um, experienced professionals some working at a lot of fortune 500 companies we have fo folks from venture capital firms who can talk about financing and how to raise capital um, and it's just a, a wide gamut of people that you can you can meet and talk to on different aspects of your business and there are they mostly are here in Arizona, but we even have folks that are outside the state and even internationally. So if that's something that you're planning on doing with your with your company is growing abroad, that's we have resources for that. And we're constantly growing our our group of mentors. And Rita here is a, one of our favored mentors in the program, and she's been very helpful for a number of our ventures. So. So what you um, need to do is if you have any idea, it's pretty, it's not a hard application. It's due April 1st, and all you need is a student on the team, and that student has to just be at least enrolled in one credit during the, when they apply. So it's due April 1st, as long as you have one student during that time, you are good to go. And even if you graduate in May, you are fine, that is fine, because we have a lot of companies that they've graduated and they're no longer students. You can be from any major, any school, any discipline, that is that is okay. You can have a team members that's your family. You can have them outside the state. But as long as one member is a student, that's all we need. And um, it's very simple. So you go to our website called studentventures.asu.edu, which Rita was showing earlier, and there is a link on there that says, you know, to apply, and it'll kind of walk you through the 
phases that you need, the parts of the application that you need. And the key elements that we're looking for is kind of your concept and what you want to do. So what your idea is, how are you going to market that? So if it's a good or a service, how are you going to sell it to your customers and what was that strategy? So that marketing strategy. We also look at the team. So we could say management team. So we, you, it looks more favorable if you have a well-rounded team. So if you're building, uh, let's say, a website and that's what your is a service, maybe it's some app or some application or software, and you don't have, you know, a website developer or you don't have some other uh, or you don't have a graphic designer um, it doesn't hurt you but it looks better if you happen to have a, f a good set of team members that can that can think through it but it's okay if you don't because that's something you can write in your application that we're currently looking for a software developer and I think um, we there's some experiences that we could talk through about some of our startups who didn't have some of the some of those skills and they still made it to Edson so uh, we also look at the budget. So I mentioned you can get up to $20,000. We look for, well, what are your asks? So maybe you don't need the full 20K. Maybe you only need 10,000. How, how would you spend that money? And the last piece is sustainability and impact. And sustainability is not the way that we think about it here at ASU in terms of uh, it being green. It's about your company. How is that going to be sustainable over time? So we look at uh, where is your revenue streams coming from? Who's spend? Who are your customers? What are you going to do with those things? And then the impact. So um, do you have uh, what kind of market potential and, and how much do you think you can capture? of that market and so forth. So those are kind of the elements that we look at. And the process um, goes through. So you'll apply. And then we have uh, we have a set of judges, that external judges, that will review. We have three judges that review every application that's applied. And then we score those, and then we will, and then those who are scored higher will then make it to the finalist round. And then in the finalist round, you will pitch in front of another series of judges, and then finally you'll be selected into the program for those who made it through. And so how, if you need help from now until April 1st and you want to if you want to apply for Edson or even if you have a startup and maybe you don't want to apply for Edson or you're not ready what we have are office hours so we are doing those throughout the campuses we have it going on here at Cronkite on Tempe in Sky Song at West Campus the Poly Camp Polytechnic Campus and you can register for one of our office hours to meet with me or another member of our team and you can bring up your idea and you just go to our entrepreneurship.asu.edu website and then there will be a link for office hours and you can register. We also have another set of office hours for SCORE mentors. If you haven't heard about SCORE, they're retired executives who want to give back. And so they do these free office hours at Sky Song every Friday from 9 to 1. And you can also sign up for those times too, where you can bring in any idea and talk them through, talk, talk to them and get some advice on things like that. We also have um, this program called Rapid Startup School where it's kind of the alternate to academic education where we enlist practitioners, those who've gone out and done certain things and to teach classes. So if it's a marketing class, we ask somebody who might be running uh, marketing for a firm to help teach a class. And we are hosting a number of those classes throughout the semester um, at Sky Song and through our Alexandria network, which is at libraries um, across, uh, well, we have three libraries now so we have one at Burton Bar at the Mesa thing spot Burton Bar uh, sorry Mesa Red Mountain um, library as well as Scottsdale uh, Civic Library and you can go into those and find some other classes but if you go on to our website you could see the list of classes that we have coming up uh, tomorrow for example we have at Sky Song how to file an LLC if that's the company that you if you want to go for an LLC you can do that we have next week on Tuesday um, how to work in, with an operating agreement so if you are going down the LLC path you need to put an operating agreement together and then we have another other ones from digital marketing to uh, logo design and trademarks and things like that so I would encourage you to look at our website and see these classes that are listed 
and that that can help you kind of get your idea thinking and if you don't have a team you might meet some people there and so finally um, if you're interested in Edson we also have a listserv that you can sign up for on the Student Venture site, and you can sign up there and put your name, and then you'll get the latest information about what's going on. So the final the deadline is April 1st, and I uh, hope that you guys all could apply. Thank you. Um, let's see if this is still on. Thank you so much. So I wanted to uh, talk to some of the students who've gone through this process, and uh, including uh, uh, those who won uh, Edson or became finalists, just to talk about their experience with it and with entrepreneurship in general. So let's start with Ariel. So you um, kind of got the entrepreneurship bug when and how, and what was your idea? Um, so I sort of started getting, well, I got started in uh, interested in entrepreneurship from my parents, they own their own business. But sort of when I got interested in it in school was um, my junior year of school, I had a friend who invited me to be a part of his startup. And it was really interesting, that startup didn't end very well, but the sort of things that I got out of it were, one, it's awesome when passionate people from dis different disciplines get together because they can accomplish so much more. Like you said, interdisciplinary teams are the most effective, especially in Edson when you're looking at uh, people that you want to be finalists. So we were able to accomplish so much. It turned out we didn't really have the basic fundamental entrepreneurship skills to really get much of anywhere. We were sort of working in the wrong direction, but that was very interesting. Um, and then the other aspect of that was that it's really hard to meet people who are from other parts of the university, even though you, everything you need to be a part of a successful startup is right here on campus. I was sort of, the reason I got involved was because uh, I met this guy in the laundry room at the dorm and he invited me to be the graphic designer for the startup. It was so random. Um, so after that thing sort of uh, fell apart, the next semester I was part of another entrepreneurship class and I'd actually forgotten to read the syllabus. So on the first day of class when they asked, what's your business idea? Uh, the only thing that was floating around in my head was, well, it would be kind of cool if there was something that connect, connect people from different disciplines because that's really hard and that would be interesting. And so over the course of the semester, I started to hone that idea and realized, wow, it would be really cool if actually there was like a matchmaking service that could connect people who had similar passions but different skills. So if I'm looking to make a website and I need a web developer, someone that could maybe match us together. And so that was really where my idea came from. Right, and um, you created uh, Accelerant. And tell us a little bit about your experience uh, in going through that process and what happened with Edson. Okay, cool. So um, I ended up after my first entrepreneurship class in Retha's class, and the goal of her class was really to create um, a sort of business plan type of thing, like how Need To outlined, which has to do with your business strategies and marketing strategies. And then also for Retha's class, a minimum viable product. Um, so for the business strategy, one of the big things that I had to work on in particular was customer development. And sort of just to throw in my own little uh, learning experiences from that, I realized that while I was doing my research, uh, there were some things that I ended up leaving out. So when I was doing customer development, I was trying to talk to passionate entrepreneurs, but of course passionate entrepreneurs are gonna be interested in my idea because this is the exact kind of thing they would want. I didn't consider that maybe that's a very small percentage of the university, and I feel like I was intentionally turning a blind eye to it. So I think that was one thing that maybe could have been a weakness later on. Um, the other aspect was I had to create a minimum viable product. Now, it's pretty ironic. Uh, this probably was my downfall in the end, but I actually didn't have a team. I'm trying to create a software, but I'm only one person, and I'm not a software developer. So like Nitu said, it's probably less likely that you're gonna be successful right off the bat if that's what you're doing. Um, so I was kind of trying to muscle through it all by myself, and finally I was fortunate enough to start asking some questions, and actually in Retha's lab we had our own software developer, it turned out, who had made the back end for the exact same type of thing I was creating. So finally through all of that coming together, finishing my customer development and getting that MVP online, I was able to connect with Edson and sort of got some really positive feedback that they would be interested in some sort of uh, entrepreneurial matchmaking type of thing. So I was like, great, this is gonna be my golden ticket. I'd also met through uh, Retha's Shark Tank, which is like an investor pitch. I'd met someone who was even interested in investing in my company, uh, angel investor and a real venture, venture capitalist. So I was like, everything's going great. I just really wanna make Edson. I think that's gonna be the ticket for me. So I had everything set up. There's probably a few weeks to go. And during those few weeks, I made a mistake. Instead of looking forward like I should have been, I sort of continued to stew on my idea and start second guessing what it is that I was doing. So I was like, oh no, maybe this business model won't work. 
and sort of I tried to hack together stuff that sort of were band-aid solutions for all my second guesses. So my application made it through, I found out, to the top 30 out of 400, so I was so excited. But then when I went in for my presentation, I sort of let things fall apart because I was trying to make up for all these little things that I had thought had become problems over the last few weeks. And lo and behold, when the judges started asking me questions, it was about all those little things that I had second guessed that wouldn't have been an issue at all. So I didn't end up making it into Edson, but it was a great learning experience overall. And just to show you a silver lining here, I work at a software company now and it's really awesome, so. <laughs> great, great. Well, you know, it works out. You know, yeah. you, you are where you're supposed to be and I'm sure you'll come back and uh, try your own thing you know, soon. So, so Brandon, you made it. You um, won an Edson, so, so let's talk about that experience. Now, he, this is a guy who was like anti-entrepreneurship. I used to speak to his graduate class here, and he'd be like, mm, you know, what does that have to do with journalism? It's like, okay. And so he came into my lab to create something for himself that then turned into a business. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, before I came back to school, I came here in 2010 to get my master's degree, and prior to that, I had been a working journalist, you know, kind of across the country working as a photographer and reporter and came back to reevaluate my skill set. And it was in my last semester here that I took Retha's lab. And Retha really kind of opened my eyes into the world of entrepreneurship and, and what that can do. Uh, as she mentioned, you know, when I started off, I was like, ah, you know, I don't want to do a business. I'm a journalist. I want to take pictures and write stories and hold people accountable. Um, and granted, I still do that today, but now I do it running two businesses. And so I came into the lab and I had this idea. I had been a photographer and I'd done a lot of projects all across the world. And every time I got back, I was frustrated by the photo slideshow software that was available. And so I said, you know, what can I do to make this process better, more efficient, um, and selfishly, I wanted to make it for myself. Because when I got back from these projects, I'd have these great photos, and I had no decent way of showing them online. Either the galleries were way too expensive, or way too fancy, or, not, or they were too simple to the fact that they weren't good for how I wanted to display my photos. So I came into the lab with that idea. I want to create a photo slideshow software that's simple, it's clean, and it's functional. And that was the basis of the idea. So I started with the idea and started building out a business plan and working with the developer in the lab uh, and came up with an actual idea. And Retha kept pushing me in that direction and started to train my, my way of thought into the world of entrepreneurship on failing and failing fast and iterating at every different direction. Uh, so the process for Edson came along and I said, hey, why not? Let me give it a shot. I could use some money to build my, my business further. So I applied and I made it through the first round to the top 30, I think it is. Um, and I had to pitch in front of a group of like 10, you know, venture capitalists and, you know, all these people that know way more about business than I do. Uh, but it, what it, it came out to is, um, I think it was, what, a minute and a half? No, it was like a five, five minute pitch. So five minutes, I pitched my, my photo slides through software, which was basically just simplifying the process, fully automating the, the first step of having a, a folder of images imports it into the software, brings in the caption information, resizes it, and spits out an embeddable HTML code that you can just plug into your website. So you can build an entire gallery from a folder of images in less than five minutes. And the judges liked it. And I was awarded a $5,000 grant from Edson. Uh, and that was in 2012 in the spring, which is also when I graduated. And I've been building that business since then. And what Edson enabled me to do was pay for things like some elancing and development that I, that I didn't have the skill set to do. Since then, I built, brought on another developer who is my business partner in this business. And I also got the, one of the most useful things, I think, for that process was uh, it's called IAP Consulting. So I got legal advice and I got business advice on my business which was really critical for me because I was a journalist and I didn't know the business side of things. I didn't know the legal side of things. And for like 250 bucks, I got like a team of four people advising me on legal matters. They helped me write an operating agreement, a non-disclosure agreement, a beta test agreement, and this stuff was really important for me. Um, so that's what really got it to that level. And as of this week, I'm negotiating right now um, to license my software to 12 to 15 media companies in the Midwest which is a big deal. Um, fingers crossed that that'll go through within the next month or so. So, you know, that's one small success story for me. And it's been remarkable. You know, and I've taken that mindset from the entrepreneurship world and taken that into the world of journalism, which is my other passion. Um, well, we'll get back to talking about um, your, your next project, but let me get Daniel in here again. 
just Mr. Entrepreneurship. He's even got the bow tie on, you know. Um, so, so talk about how, where you are, what you're doing right now. You've created this beautiful website and, and beautiful way for people in downtown Phoenix to connect with each other. But that wasn't your first uh, venture. You had two, I think, in my lab. 20, 20 ventures? <laughs> um, I've failed so many times, uh, and that is the, the process I've, I've gone through. Um, what's the first idea, what it was, um, it was kind of like a Reddit for educational videos, um, and that didn't go anywhere. Um, and then I tried to make something where it was a, I wanted to make uh, like a Google Hangouts for tour guides uh, who could give tours before people went on trips. And that didn't go anywhere. Um, and the, the thing I kept finding was that I was trying to solve this huge problem that like, I was expecting uh, like a large a mass of people to use in order for it to be successful. Um, and I, the problem was still like a valid problem. Like people still uh, go on these trips, for instance, the, the, for example, the, the one I was trying to make with the tour guides, uh, people still go on trips and expect to have this Anthony Brennan experience, and they want to uh, um, see all these cool little things, but they end up falling to the trap of being in the tourism circle where you see like TripAdvisor and all those things. And there was still like a valid problem, but I wasn't gonna be solving it, A, with the te uh, technology know-how that I didn't have, or um, even, even the, the people I was trying to serve. There was, it, you can't just say everybody is who you're trying to serve. Um, a big part of what Rita's class was trying to teach was, was maybe I didn't get it during the class, I definitely got it in the hard knocks of life, but um, the, you can't, your answer can't be I, my market is everybody. Um, and, and so that's really where I started to fall into, well, what do I know? Like I know downtown Phoenix, I, I know the community here, I am invested in the community here, I care about the people here. Um, that turned into me launching a housing guide. Um, I didn't think there was enough people who knew how to, how to make, uh, how, to, how to live here, or where, uh, what's, what's the word? So like people would move here and then, um, like to the dorms for instance, and then move out to Tempe because they have no idea what's going on here. Um, I wanted to change that around where people were in moving into a community and then secondary was where they lived. Um, and then that evolved into some craziness that turned into this, where I'm actually creating a travel guide for Phoenix. Um, and, and all of this is just like, I, I, I filled in the gaps in my education here with um, something that's, that's like Khan Academy for, for programming. Um, it, it's called uh, a treehouse. If you guys ever get a chance or care about uh, uh, getting into web development, I learned how to web develop through this pro program, Treehouse. Um, so this isn't a computer science school, which is always what I say when I'm when I'm here. But it's it's that doesn't mean you can't become a web developer. You can't play. I play with uh, WordPress and create these custom themes and everything. And I made a side business out of it. I do client websites. Um, and uh, like make small business websites, and this is my own personal project um, that I'm launching this month, hopefully. And I got when at, at the point when you fill in the gaps with the technology, at that point your team is is the the stuff the you know the stuff that isn't as important as your baby, your idea. Um, and that's really my takeaway was that I was able to make something uh, by filling in the gaps. Um, if you want to be a web developer, go. You know, you can still do that and provide important information to people. Um, and it, it, I don't consider this like a journalistic endeavor, um, but I, it's definitely valuable information that people should know about Phoenix. So, yeah, knowing knowing who who you're serving is is the biggest takeaway I think from this. Well, I, it doesn't hurt that the Super Bowl will be here a year from <laughs> from now, and people are already starting to look at coming to Phoenix, where they should stay. Uh, my house is for rent. No, um, where they should stay and, you know, what they should do. So you're in the right place at the right time. You know, Brandon, let me get you back in. Speaking of the right place at the right time, you have this other venture that you started that is I think is so on time because of everything. We hear in this building a lot about, you know, the 
journalism is, you know, falling away and, you know, um, news is not as important perhaps to some people as it used to be and, you know, all these news sites are having trouble, but you stepped into that, uh, that, that arena and you've got a pretty compelling offering. Absolutely. So, um, as I had mentioned, I had started this photo slideshow software. It's called Journal, Journal Picks now, and Retha's class, and a number of things had really helped push me in the direction of um, innovation and how can we um, not save the business of journalism because uh, it's still robust, but how can we fix it to a degree and, and add value to what we're doing? And, and I was here, I worked with News 21 in the summers with Retha. Um, you know, and that's this great investigative project, and, it, and it's hard-hitting investigative reporting. And I said, you know, Arizona has been decimated in the last five years, the, the media market has. There's been so many job layoffs and contraction in local media, and what's really missing today is that hardcore investigative reporting that takes time and it takes money. Uh, and across the country over the last five years or so, there's been this kind of explosion in nonprofit newsrooms that have popped up in different states. And some of those have become incredibly successful. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of ProPublica, the Center for Investigative Reporting, are just two of those. And I said, you know, Arizona could really use something like that. Um, it's not to, I'm not here to compete with the Arizona Republic or 12 News or ABC 15. I'm here to serve as a resource for the state of Arizona uh, to do depth reporting. And that was where the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting came about. Um, we've been incorporated for about a year and a half now. Uh, we don't do daily news coverage. We don't do breaking news. We do long form, in-depth investigative reporting. And data is at the heart of what we do. So we are a nonprofit business model. That doesn't mean that we we don't make money. And by the way, we are accepting donations if any of you are interested. Um, <laughs> but we are fully funded by foundations and individual donations. Uh, we are not beholden to any corporate entity or any bottom dollar uh, for somebody like Gannett, for example. Um, I'm accountable to the people of Arizona and to our board of directors. And, and the, the reason that I really like this motto is, is A, because of that, partly, because we are not beholden to anyone. Uh, we can do the level of work that we need to do without worrying about losing a sponsor, uh, because ultimately it'll be the public of Arizona that funds us and supports us. Uh, before we open it up to, to questions, I really want to hear you. Uh, Ariel, what was the scariest thing about kind of stepping out there you know, on your own with the idea of starting your own business? And how did you overcome that fear? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, I think the scariest thing about getting out there is realizing as you get into it, you don't notice it right away, but as you get into it, how much you don't know. Because the more research that you do, the more research that you realize you need to do, and so I think the hardest part is realizing when you just need to take action. And that's different for everyone, so I can't dole out advice here of like, this is a definitive time when you just need to get in there. But there was a point for me where I need to stop doing research and like, I'm just gonna make my MVP, and even though I want 2,000 features in this, this is gonna be the one feature, and I'm just going with it. So I think that was the way I overcame that. Yeah, Dan Gilmore has a great saying that if you wait until it's perfect, then you've waited too long. Uh, and you think about all the sites and all the companies that have started, and they weren't perfect, and they iterate it, and they iterate it until they get it to the point that it is now. I mean, very few companies kind of jump out there, and it's like all perfect from day one. I mean, Facebook is still working on itself. <clears throat> you know, Dell and, and Ford and, you know, all of these companies that have been around for a long time, they're constantly reinventing and changing. So don't let that fear hold you back. Um, let me open it up for uh, questions to the panel, and then we can kind of continue to talk a little bit more about this whole process. <laughs> Any questions um, out there? Let me ask you, how many people know what Changemaker Central is? Okay. All right, uh, Nitu, can you talk a little bit more about that? and how that can help them. Yeah, Changemaker Central is um, a great place for, it's on every campus, and I'm actually not sure, here it's located over at the, yeah, and the- Post, yeah, post office. Yeah, and uh, that's actually where we host our office hours. Actually, here I think it's a little bit different location. It's an office here, but that is a place where you can go to meet with others. It is for kind of high impact careers, so it's, it's more than, it's broader than just entrepreneurship. They have, uh, off opportunities that they discuss about um, 
uh, Teach for America or Peace Corps, and it's really um, a place where you want to make a change, hence Change Maker. And it's it's a great opportunity, I think, for all students to go out there and meet with others. There's they have whiteboards where they try to put ideas if you're looking for somebody or opportunities that are coming up or classes, events, um, and and stuff like that. We there's even um, they host some speaker sessions over there too. Um, I know on the Tempe campus, it's at the Memorial Union, and and they they have quite a bit of space for it, and they they're doing a lot of different things out there for for uh, for entrepreneurs and and those beyond that. Okay, great. Questions? I think back here. Um, thank you guys first for coming out and doing this. Uh, other than the gentleman from Journal Picks, did you did anybody have a journalism background or were you guys all off the bat kind of more business driven web based driven etc um, we were all journalism okay and uh, I think the benefit that we've all had is we were sort of interested in different aspects of it so I was really interested in graphic design and web development in addition to business and journalism by the end kind of became a side note for me of course it doesn't have to do that for everyone but I'm the worst journalism student. <laughs> I, uh, I floated from journalism to PR, and then, uh, no offense to PR, I just, I wanted to make something that I, I always had this nightmare if I went into like a PR agency that I would uh, get assigned uh, Kraft Cheese as a client, and I would have to be passionate about making press releases for Kraft Cheese, and that scared me away from doing anything related to PR. So I went into entrepreneurship, and that's where I found, I, mean, I went through Dan's and Retha's class, and I uh, graduated in May, so I mean, I've, we've all gone through the, the programs here, so, yeah. Oh, and, you know, I'll, I'll just add from that, I mean, you know, I still do journalism every day right now, um, but I also run two businesses at the same time. and. In today's media landscape, if you're interested in journalism and if you're interested in the future of journalism, um, those are two are merged now. In the past, you had your business office and you had your newsroom, and they never talked. That was like an absolute taboo in the journalism industry. Today, you have to do both, and you have to understand both. Um, you know, every day I, I think about how am I going to do this year-long investigation? How am I going to pay for it? And I say, well, I need to diversify my revenue stream. So I need to think of how can I hold events to bring people in? How can I do uh, public records trainings and have the public come in? And I, and I train them and they pay me to do that. That's what's going to pay for my journalism. So the business side and the journalism side for me are, are, yes, there are separations. I would rather turn down money than have strings attached to money for my investigations. Um, but they are linked and they are merged. And I do them both every day. And sorry, just one more question. Um, other than the... Uh, the Edison, did you guys have a lot of opportunities to kind of grow your entrepreneurship and your business side? Because I know you were saying you kind of hopped around from one thing to PR to the other, and I, I don't know how many of you maybe changed your course of action or whatnot, but it seems like obviously business is you know, getting that side and kind of honing that craft is going to be more beneficial for us too if we want to continue to do, like you said, the journalism side. The, the project is always more important than how you're going to make money doing the project, I'll say. I've learned that a lot, actually. Um, I, I mean, I still do client websites that are not my projects um, in order to make money, and the things I do are passion projects. Um, I'm, you guys can relate, I'm sure. Just uh, it's, it's always, you're, you're still chasing the money. Um, at the end of the day, you still want it to be a successful and sustainable project. But the, the project itself isn't reliant on how much money you're going to make. Yeah. But, but just to emphasize a little bit, you know, what's special about ASU and what's happening in some other universities across the country is, is solving the problem with the guy who gave the money to Crow to start Edson is that they're baking into the university support for entrepreneurs. From Edson to the ASU Innovation Challenge to so many of the other projects, uh, 10,000 Solutions and so on and so forth, uh, in every part of the university here, from Cronkite all over, they've got these entrepreneurship classes because they're basically saying, 
we're gonna help you get there. If you wanna start something, whatever it is, even if you wanna start a restaurant or like I said, a craft brewery, we will help you where you don't have to go to your classes all day, stay up at night, you know, three o'clock in the morning trying to work on something. You can take a class where all day, every day, that's what you do. So in my lab, um, the students are usually there two days a week. And so you think about from, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock, this is what, if two days a week, this is what they're working on is their business, as opposed to doing other things and then coming home and catching a nap and then trying to work on it. So they can go meet with clients, they can work on their business plan, they're getting feedback from me. And then at um, the Cary School of Business out in CS, uh, in nursing innovation all over the university, they've got these things kind of baked in so that you can try to launch that business as a student. What better time to incubate your idea than when you're young and you're fresh and you know, you're flexible like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all these other people. Um, it's harder when you're a young 30 year old like me to come home from, uh, just kidding, come home from work and with a kid and then work on my business, and which I do. But you all have that advantage, and other universities are trying to step up, but ASU is way ahead of this in terms of pro providing that support. But I think we had another question over here, some other comments, want to get some other people involved? Uh, so my question is for the whole board, just um, all of you guys want to ask, like, what's the key to time management, having a social life, and then having <laughs> businesses, I mean, you know, having multiple businesses and then you're doing journalism and it's very complicated and be very in-depth it sounds like you know you wouldn't have time for anything that it sounds very difficult so i was just wondering if there's like something you guys were all doing to separate things and still like see other human living people like ever ever okay you can do it um yeah I'll, I'll start um you know You've got to find some balance of personal life and professional life. Um, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I, I just can't help it. It's just in my nature. Um, part of the reason I'm a journalist because I, I, I like working. Um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time, to be honest with you. I, I, would, I give up sleep to get things done. You know, running two businesses plus being an adjunct part-time um, and, and then helping out with News 21 in the summers, I, I don't have a lot of time. And you know, my friends will tell you too that that you know they're like, what? You know, I haven't seen Brandon in like two and a half months. Where's he been? You know, somebody should check on that guy. Um, it's because I work all the time. Uh, but I'm trying now to find a better balance and to at least put one day a week where I take at least a half day off, and and where I go out and I'm into the outdoors a bunch. So I just get the hell out of the city and go into the mountains or take my kayak out and and get out. But the the time management I think is a huge huge thing. Um, when you're juggling that many things, when you're learning new things and dealing with people, you've got to be good at time management. And and some people like a hard copy <coughs> weekly planner. Uh, I, I have a combination of that and a thing called Asana, which is an online uh, task management software. So it's 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 up to the person and it, it is hard. I mean, if you wanna make it work, you gotta be into this stuff. If, if you're not into it uh, and you're not putting in the time, then then your venture will only be as good as the time that you put into it. So. And also, there's a, a quote that um, a lot of entrepreneurs joke about is they give up the eight hour work day to work 12 hours as an entrepreneur. Um, it's, and, it's, and part of it is you're, it's, it's the fun, you have a passion for it, you know? It's, it, that's, if you're working at, you know, in an office desk space and you have, you know, nine to five uh, and you're not passionate about what you're doing, then yeah, that's work. But like we're making things that we care about, or like we're we're seeing ideas through. It's almost like you you're you have a like a, if you were working in a garden and you're building, you're it, you wouldn't consider that work. Other people outside would say, yeah, that's work. Um, but you're you're making something that you care about. So um, that's a I mean that's the best analogy I think. Uh, let's get another uh, question. I think I saw another a couple of hands here. Uh, yes, um, this question's for Brandon. Um, when you were going to do or start your second business, what thoughts were going through your mind and how did how were you able to just justify that, uh, so to speak? I, I really still haven't. <laughs> I, just, I just did it. Um, 
you know, I, I knew that it was going to be hard starting another business, and I knew that it was going to be a huge time commitment, resource commitment, you know. Um, I pay my bills by being an adjunct and, and working in the summer for News 21. Uh, at, at AZCIR right now, we still don't have enough operational funding to give everybody a salary. So um, when I started, how am I going to do it? I just did it. Um, I, I thought about it. The timing was right. I finished one big project, and I was like, man, let's give this a shot. And, you know, it's been a year and a half, and I'm still doing it. So it wasn't a matter of, like, really sitting and planning. It was just like, I'm either going to do this or I'm not. So I just dove in and, and, and did it. Um, it's just, yeah, that's, sorry, that's, that's all I got. Right here. Yep. Um, so my questions for any of the panelists. So um, how did you all find uh, creativity in pursuing each of your own entrepreneurial ventures? Um, in what way? Can you add an extra clarification to that? Um, in terms of kind of finding a brand name for yourself or in the graphics, how do you think of those things? How do you bring up that creativity to make those aspects that create your business? Um, well, for me personally, I really enjoy uh, the graphic and branding elements of it. So for me, basically, it was just sitting around while I'm in my pajamas at home with my roommates, drawing stuff on a piece of paper. And then, fortunately, I know how to use enough programs that once I'm like, oh, that looks pretty decent, I can start putting it on the computer and then just playing with it. But I already have an artistic aspect that likes to do that. So for me, it was pretty easy to iterate. And I know other people who are art artsy as well. So they just joined me in that. Uh, for me, um, I was tired of losing. Um, there's, um, it, it's, it's uh, so it, anyone who lives in downtown Phoenix and who has gone to all of these, hearings or watch the news or read um, the local paper, um, there's, there's a lot of things that we've lost in the recent past. Um, uh, notably, there's the, the Circle K issue or the, um, what was it? Now we're gonna lose the camel view or we're gonna lose, um, uh, we lost uh, this, this hotel to a green parking lot. Um, and you see all of these things, and I was tired of seeing it happen. I was tired of reacting to it after I heard about the fact. Um, there's a, there's, when you're saying like you solve a problem and, and, and having a certain demographic that you're speaking to when you're solving that problem, that's what this, that's what, what I built is trying to do. I want people to care about uh, uh, historical preservation. I want them to care about local business. I want them to care about uh, walkability or bikeability. And I'm approaching that in a fun way that is tourism. And um, I mean, I'm making tours that are going to go from this historic location to this local business. And it, it's all from not wanting to lose anymore and making it not about a policy hearing or a zoning hearing because those are boring. Um, but that's where, I mean, that's where the creativity comes in, is how do I solve that problem without it being boring? Go ahead, need to. Uh, oh, I just wanted to add, if, you, if you're looking for an idea, one of the things that we always tell our entrepreneurs is, is take a journal around with you and start writing things in there. I know um, I'm in my second startup, but I, I always have a journal, or you use your phone, and you might be driving in that car and you say, hey, that bugs me, and I want to change that. So write it down, and you never know when you'll look at it. Um, I know the startup that I'm in right now, it was an idea that was over probably like six years ago. So you never know where it comes from. Um, I love the concept of looking at problems. That's one of the things that we always advocate. But you might have, you know, a t-shirt idea, a new shoe, or things like that that could come back. Um, I remember something that came back to me when I was a kid and I used to dream about. So you it's good to keep a journal. It's like, like you're an artist. You want to write down your thoughts. Um, you might get names uh, for different concepts. I know Gordon McConnell, who's our assistant VP for entrepreneurship, and innovation um, he is constantly he has names and he he writes them down and then years later he's like I'm gonna use that name now for this venture so that's there's there's creativity all over the place also talking to people going out there experiencing the world helps as well um, so you can find different things that spark that innovation spark that idea for you and so those kind of things um, and we always recommend talk to as many 
many people. It's not, you might be worried about your idea, but it's not, at this point we kind of say that a lot of people probably have thought about that same idea. It's about the execution side of it. So I go around talking to people. Um, uh, just to put a plug in, um, right here on February 21st, which is a Friday, we're gonna have a hack day where we're gonna invite, you know, people can RSVP to me, retha.hill at asu.edu. And what we're gonna do is have um, journalism students, other students from different parts of uh, ASU, different parts of, of downtown, we'll have computer science students and we'll have design students. We're gonna divide you into teams. You won't know each other and we'll have a design question and you come up with what you come up with. Now what we're hoping is by the end of that day that you'll have a clickable or some sort of functioning thing, whatever it is you come up with. And who knows, you might meet that person that you wanna to continue to, to do a project with, you might really like the thing that you came up with during that day and wanna take it to the next level. The good thing about February 21st is that you still have you know, um, more than a month to put it, pull it together to apply for Etsen. But beyond Etsen, you have, there are a number of different ventures that are out there to give you money. Challenge.gov, they always have contests where they'll ask you, come up with a way to make television more social. Well, that's a design question. How can you make, you're watching TV, what can you do to make it more social? besides just texting or posting on Facebook. You have other challenges, like how do we make women safe on college campuses using uh, technology? That was a design question from a couple years ago and some of the grad students here worked on that. So there are a ton of these. Night is funding, is, is a bunch of money out there and, and never leave money on the table, try to get that. But February 21st, you know, if you're so inclined, RSVP, you know, we're, we're gonna start at 9 a.m. and we're gonna see what we come up with. And once you kind of get that bug, as I think Brandon can attest to, it, it, it doesn't leave you. I've won a couple of grants, working on a couple of startups myself, and it's something that I think about all the time. You know, this should be a business, I could do this, you know. And if there were 10 of me, I'd be wealthy. But um, I'm not, so I'm counting on all of you to be wealthy in, in my place and then hire me later. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Thoughts for the panel? If not, let me finish with one other thing. Nitu, what's the biggest mistake that people make when they're trying to put together their business or applying for Edson? Well, we see a lot of people doing it last minute, so that, that definitely happens. Um, let's see, the biggest, um, they haven't thought about who would be their customer. So it's that concept, they'll, I'll build it, they'll come kind of thing, and a lot of people have made that mistake. So not thinking who will buy it, who can use it. And we see that over and over again in office hours and in, in the Edson competition. And so I, I, that's where I really um, advocate for you guys to go out and talk to potential customers, kind of like what you were talking about earlier, and how um, you should really learn who how your business model will be how will you those different revenue streams because that will impact your business yeah so that would be the biggest thing that I've learned here's the expert any other questions for her any other questions don't hold back don't be shy it's not crazy whatever your question is all right well I hope to see all of you you know at least making an attempt the best time to fail is when you're here in school, and not failing your classes, but here in school where you're working on a business, if it doesn't work, no harm, no foul, you walk away from it. It's a little bit more difficult when you have the kids and the mortgage and the da 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 Even though you can still do it, and people do it all the time, 50-year-olds are like the second biggest group that start businesses, you know, next to the 18-year-olds. But this is the time to try it. And if I've had students come up with plans and they did not work. I had a student a couple years ago wanted to make ebooks more social. Couldn't make a business out of it. She tried, we tried, we tried. It could not be a business. Uh, about a, a few weeks after we concluded that this was busted, I get a phone call from my old boss at the Washington Post like, do you have any um, interns who could possibly work on an ebook business? And I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And she went to Washington, worked on that ebook, uh, Watergate 25th anniversary, whatever it was. And she's in the business now of creating ebooks for people. She's going to do my ebook. And she got that business, but it wasn't the one that she wanted to have initially, but she still succeeded. So failure is not always a bad thing, especially if you do all the work and she did the work. She still got an A in my class 
and she got a business out of it. So my advice is just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, try it where it's safe and we can all support you. So um, hopefully we'll see you, you know, at Edson real soon. Thank you.